I don't know what time is it in your country, but it's uh, 747 Montreal. I welcome you to this session on electromagnetic transients. Uh, my name is Jean Maserejan. I am the chair of this session. So we have uh, several very interesting papers to present today. Uh, we will basically start with the first one. We have uh, 15 minutes for each paper. If you have questions, you have to use uh, 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 the Q&A window. And uh, then I will read the question and we'll ask the presenter to answer them. The first paper is interpolation for power electronic circuit simulation revisited with mat matrix exponential and dense outputs. The presenter is Zixiang Meng. Zixiang Meng received his bachelor degree in electrical engineering from Tianjin University in China in 2018. He is currently pursuing the master's degree in the School of Electrical Engineering and Automation at Tianjin University. His research interests include simulation of electromagnetic transients, power electronics, and MMC HVDC. Please, Mr. Meng, you can start presenting now. Hi, everyone. It is my honor to introduce some of our recent research here. The title is Interpolation for Power Electronic Circuit Simulation Revisited with Matrix, Exponential, and Dense Output. The following content contains five sections. The first section is introduction. Uh, why did we start the research? There were three reasons. With large scale application of power electronic equipment, the power system is facing unprecedented challenges in its operation and control. A recent study, uh, this paper uh, reported the accuracy degradation of EMT, EMT type uh, programs in, uh, in power electric uh, simulation because the way of handling the switching events uh, generally uh, introduce a great error than the integration method. In our previous research, we proposed uh, the matrix exponential based method and it is a fairly accurate algorithm. Correspondingly, it is affected more by the way of handling the switching events, which leads to a greater degradation in accuracy. Uh, in the following PowerPoint, we use MEXP to refer to matrix exponential based method. So we would like to design a high precision matrix exponential based method solver suitable for power electronic simulation. In the second section, I will introduce the matrix exponential based method and high order interpolation based on dense output. Power electric, electronic circuits always contain a large number of switches. The set space model of a system with P independent switch groups has a general form as I show here. It is a piecewise linear model and the state matrix A uh, is dependent on the switch setter's values SI. SI represents the state of the I independent switch group, which is our binary value. Uh, for a linear system, assuming a constant UT over the interval T0 to T0 plus H, the simplest exponential integration formula is as follows. It turns out this formula is sufficiently accurate for a large portion of power system simulation studies and is especially, especially attractive due to its high accuracy. And this is the matrix uh, exponential term. Efficiently solving this term is the key to practical application of this formula. And the, yeah. currently the best way is uh, the scaling and scoring method. Uh, which mainly uses party function approximation, where k and m are the order of the numerator and the denominator of party km approximation. Uh, the local error introduced by the party km approximation is of k plus m plus one order. This equation illustrates that we can adjust the accuracy of matrix exponential operator by adjusting parameter k and m in part the approximation. Uh, if we want to use high order interpolation to adjust the interpolation accuracy, we need uh, additional interpoints, internal points. In our previous work, accurate dense output formula is proposed based on the scaling and scoring method. 
the formula can re return additional internal out outputs, and uh, this formula returns the first S output located at this time point. This formula reuses the intermediate results of the scaling and scoring method, so it has no additional cost. And because these dense outputs amount to simulation results of rapidly halved step sizes, their accuracy is no worse than that of the original X. So dense output formulas are efficient methods to get internal outputs. Next, to improve the accuracy of the way of handling the switching events, the process of quadratic interpolation based on dense output formulas is proposed. What is special is that we use dense output, output formulas to get the inner uh, output at TD. If we use the outer output at uh, T0 uh, minus H to do quadratic interpolation, there will be no accuracy improvement. So the inner output is necessary. In section three, we propose a matching strategy and design solvers based on this strategy. Firstly, we list the error sources of matrix exponential based method, EMTP and PISPAD. The common point of, of the three methods is that they all have higher accuracy in simulation without switch events and we are faced the problem of precision reduction when switch events occur. Uh, what are listed above are local error sources, but how about the global error? The effect of local error accumulation on global error is summarized in this paper. Assuming, assuming the dominant local error is Q order, difference on step, steps of dominant local error lead to different global error. If the local error at all steps are dominant errors, the global error is Q minus one order. If the local errors at switch events are dominant errors, the global error is Q order. According to error sources in table one, EMTP, PISCAD, and the matrix exponential based method all belong to the situation B. So the accuracy of EMTP and PISCAD reduced from second order to first order and the matrix exponential based method returns second order global accuracy in power electronic circuit simulation. So a reasonable combination leads to loss of integration accuracy. The matching strategy is proposed to avoid the accuracy loss. Assuming the errors are introduced only by num numerical integration method and the interpolation method, which are Q order and P, P order. When P equals Q minus one, the global error determined by both methods is Q minus one order. So the combination is economical. When P equals Q, the Q order interpolation method is start slightly more accurate so it can hold the accuracy of the integration met method to achieve better results. It makes sense when the added cost is only marginal. In short, the matching strategy is to combine Q order numerical integration methods with Q, Q order or Q minus one order interpolation method. Based on the analysis, we can start to design new solvers. As we mentioned before, we can use party approximation to adjust the accuracy of matrix exponential best method to match the interpolation method. Table two lists the pot uh, potential options for matrix exponential approximation from second order to first order. Among them, the first row has the same form as the forward order method, which is not as stable. And the third row has the same form as the implicit trapezoid method and may face the problem of numerical oscillation. So the final, so final reasonable choices are to combine part D01 uh, exponential formula with in a linear interpolation and to combine part D12 exponential formula with quadratic interpolation. For easy reference, reference, these two options are abbreviated as EXP01L and EXP12Q respectively. In the next section, we present two case studies to demonstrate the proposed solvers and compare with EMT sim, uh, simulation tools.
The first case is single phase TCR circuit. In this case, the right. proposed solvers are compared with widely used EMT simulation tools, including mm -hmm. EMTP, PSCAD, and Artemis. Because PSCAD cannot solve the RDO switches, the binary on off resistance model of power electronics devices are adopted. Yeah, yeah, the problem is that I uh, figure three shows the overall shape of simulation waveforms from different methods are close. Uh, figure four shows the absolute errors between these methods and the analytic solution. The maximum errors of the first order accuracy method, uh, EMTP, PISCAD, Artemis, and EXP01 uh, use the um, uh, uh, EXP01L are in the range of 10. Uh, although EXP01L use the lowest precision numerical integration method, and the Artemis uh, use the hi hi highest uh, highest uh, accu accuracy uh, in integration method, their global error, their global accuracy orders are, are the same. Uh, MEXP proposed in previous research is also added to the com uh, comparison, referred as MEXPL and MEXPQ, which stand for the matrix exponential based method combined with linear and quadratic interpolation respectively. MEXPL has, has three order of magnitude smaller maximum error compared with the first order method. MEXPQ and uh, uh, exp one to q has additional three order of magnitude smaller maximum errors than MEXPQ, uh, MEXPL. Um, figure five shows the step size versus uh, global error to show clearly the order of each compared solvers. exp zero one has the same order uh, and the same order global accuracy with EMTP, PISCAD, and Artemis. Uh, exp one to q has third order global error, which is the highest among all mentioned methods. The curves of exp one to q and MEXPQ almost coincide, so, uh, which indicates that although exp one to q use a lower order matrix exponential approximation than that of MEXPQ. The accuracy reduction is limited. So, a very interesting case. Uh, yes. Reminding that uh, we will divide. Uh, we we lost you there. One group associated. Uh, sorry, my PowerPoint. Open secret. Uh, uh, the second. The second test case is an uh, open loop nearest level controlled one phase of a MMC system containing eight MMC submodules. The RDL switching model is used in this case. The step, the step size is 20 microseconds. In this case, all compared methods still can get the right results. And the EMTP and the EXP01 has the largest error. Uh, exp one to q and MEXPQ still have the highest accuracy. I'm sorry, there are some errors. Oh. Um, Fig 9 shows the global errors of this method. From this case with RDL switching model, we can reach the same conclusion as the case with binary on of resistance model. Uh, the simulation results show that the exp one q solver has good performance and applicability in high frequency complex power electronic systems. After the bar analysis and the case studies, we can draw the following conclusions. The way of handling the switching events generally limits the accuracy of the algorithms and the combination of numerical integration method and the inter interpolation method is important for the accuracy of the algorithms. A matching strategy is proposed to guide the combination of numerical integration method and the interpolation method. 
uh, high order interpolation methods which have good applicability to the matrix exponential based method are proposed based on dense output, output formulas. And finally, two new solvers are proposed for matrix exponential based method, which are stable and one of them is more accurate than existing MT simulation tools in power electronic simulation. Well, thanks for your listening. Mm. Oh, that's all. Okay. Is it not turned off? Is it not connected? Oh. So they don't seem to have uh, questions for the moment. Okay, a quick question. According to what I understand, are you suppressing numerical oscillations actually? Hello, is, is Meng still there? Did you hear my question? Hmm? Did you hear my question? I was asking if you are actually suppressing numerical oscillations. Hi, John. Um, maybe I can answer the question? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, uh, the, the numerical integration method we use, uh, which is the uh, matrix exponential based method, it is the uh, L-stable uh, integration method. It's, it's similar to the um, implicit uh, Euler method. There is the, uh, naturally, there is no uh, numerical oscillation phenomenon uh, mm -hmm. associated with the method. So. Uh, in our case, we don't have the problem of the uh, oscillation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, we noticed also that uh, for methods that do not have this, this possibility, uh, the location of the discontinuity had impact on the accuracy. Uh, so it was not obvious to say that if you use interpolation, you have better, more error or less error. I don't know if you observe similar similar things in, in techniques that you do not necessarily do use interpolation or do not use interpolation. The interpolation location had in impact on the accuracy of results. Have you noticed something similar in your observations? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, um, uh, there is, um, we didn't um, compare these results in our, in this paper, but uh, I've observed, uh, you know, previous paper, which, uh, uh, we showed in the slide uh, that um, reported the uh, uh, yes. accuracy com comparison. Uh, they have they have several cases that um, uh, they compare PSCAD and EMTP. Um, we know EMTP don't have interpolation and PSCAD have interpolation. But according to their results, it, it is um, not always uh, the case that um, PSCAD is more accurate or EMTP is more accurate. There, uh, there, Actually, um, uh, I think more uh, detailed uh, study can be done to to show if uh, it indeed is the case that uh, interpolation always outperforms uh, the method without interpolation. I think it it it, it requires more more study. Okay, I don't see any questions in the Q&A as far as I'm concerned. So first uh, presentation, now we can go to the second presentation. So I have to make myself a presenter now. Uh, can everybody see my screen now? Okay, so the next paper is from uh, Antonio Lima, frequency dependent equivalent based on idempotent decomposition and grouping. So the presenter is Professor Lima. Uh, he received the, the master and doctor degree in electrical engineering from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, in 1997 and 1999. In 1998, he was a visiting scholar at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of British Columbia. 
from 2000 to 2002, he was with the Brazilian independent system operator. Since 2002, he is with the electrical engineering department, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where presently he is a full professor and the head of the electrical engineering department. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here in our presentation. My name is Antonio Lima. I am a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I'll be presenting our paper Frequency Dependent Equivalent based on idempotent decomposition and grouping. The authors are myself, Dr. Felipe Câmara from Furnas, it's a utility in Brazil, Professor João Salvador from Cefet, another university in Rio, and Professor Maria Teresa Correa de Barros from the University of Lisbon. Uh, the paper is organized as follows. I first will present a brief introduction of the subject and all the bases of our work. Then I will go to some the idea of idempotent decomposition and grouping. Then we move to the frequency domain realization of the fitted, so we can achieve a fitted network. We will present some results regarding the time domain realization of uh, one test cases. And then we move to the conclusions of our paper. This introduction, uh, in power system nowadays, we have to deal with this, basically these three topics. One is the network expansion, the other one is the environment constraints, and uh, with the, and the, this leads to the, the increase in the complexity of power system nowadays. And uh, as the power systems are becoming more and more complex, it's becoming more difficult to represent in detail the large networks involved. And uh, typically we deal with uh, a large representation of the network, but just using pos positive sequence equivalents. And sometimes we add some machine dynamics, but then if we go to a full detail representation in phase domain of overhead transmission lines, transformers, and uh, all the components involved, it can become a very large system and we may lead to a unfeasible scenario, simulation scenario. So basically this is the issue we have at the end. If we go to a detailed representation, we will be, we'll be facing a very large network. It will be time consuming. In some cases, it's not even feasible under the computer capabilities of our time. Although the other path, let's say this way, if we can find uh, a suitable network equivalent, we will end up with a small network, which will be easily implemented in the time domain software, but then we need to be assured that we are representing as accurate as possible all the eigenvalues involved in this equivalent. So we have the issue of uh, the frequency evaluation or the analysis of frequency dependent equivalents, not only in the frequency domain, but also the, its transient behavior. One could suggest that we should do a direct fitting of the equivalent modern admittance matrix of such, uh, such an area of the system or of the region that you want to calculate the equivalent. But this direct fitting typically will present a poor precision. An alternative to improve 
the quality of this fitting. It's using something as, that has been called as mode revealing transformation that improves the observability of the smallest eigenvalues at the lowest frequencies. And uh, we are proposing an alternative approach where we use the idempotent decomposition of the nodal, the, of the equivalent nodal antimutants matrix. We then group in two sets, one dealing with the small eigenvalues, other one dealing with the large eigenvalues. It's important to say that uh, what we are calling small and large uh, with reference to the low frequency behavior, because we know at the high frequency, both part of the networks will present a, a very oscillatory behavior. So what's the idea of the idempotent decomposition? Given a, a dimitans matrix Y of N, it will be represented by a series of matrices they are associated with the eigenvalues of the original adimita, equivalent admittance matrix. Then, instead of fitting each single idempotent, we will group them depending on the behavior they present. Uh, naturally, we have to discuss whether this approach will lead to uh, an accurate response, not only in the frequency domain, but also in the time domain. And uh, we'll discuss this in our paper and in this presentation as well. So the main idea of the paper is to decompose our equivalent admittance in idempotent. So we start with the eigenvalue decomposition. Here we have the eigenvectors, and then we have the eigenvalue matrix. We can rewrite this equation as this, which will lead us to several matrices, M of Y times the eigenvalue Y of I. Just remembering that Ti are the column vectors of the eigenvectors matrix, and S of I are the row vectors of the inverse of the eigenvector matrix. This matrix M of I, it's what we call the idempotent matrix. In a given network, typically we can group these two matrices in uh, one that is related to the open circuit, the eigenvalues associated with the open circuit behavior, and another one dealing with the eigenvalues of the short circuit behavior. So each of these matrix will represent by a set of the idempotent matrices. So if we have the system N, if we have another N of the actual Adimitan systems, we will have one group of the Adimitans going from one to the half of its rank, and the other from half plus one to the actual rank of the original Adimitans matrix. Uh, we could test the system in several cases. Here we decided to, f to use a, a case that we think would be more interesting to highlight the suitability of our proposed approach. We, we could use to uh, frequency dependent network equivalent, but in, not, in this case, it is not guaranteed that a, sh a larger eigenvalue ratio will be presented. As far as we, we know, uh, representation of a non-uniform transmission line 
it's a case where one finds a very large eigenvalue ratio. So it would be a very interesting case to test our approach. Just to remind you that uh, we will divide the group at either point in one group associated with the behavior of open, open circuit currents and the other associated with the short circuit currents. Here, it's uh, our test case. It's uh, one relating to the Amazon River crossing. It's a very tall structure. This is over 300 meters high. Here we have the uh, schematic of the conductors. We see that the, the tower reach over 330 meters. Here we have the data of the whole system. And this is a, a twin circuit, 500 kV. And uh, we represent the, the line span. It's over two kilometers and 700 meters. It's a, a very wide line span. And we represent it using 35 uniform line in cascade. We use the chain matrix to obtain the overall equivalent admittance, and we consider a frequency range from, from 0.1 hertz up to 1 megahertz, and we have used 350 samples. Here we have the open secret eigenvalues, and then we have the the ones associated with uh, this in red, we have the ones with a short circuit currents that decrease with the frequency. And then uh, in blue, we have the open circuit, it's uh, the blue lines. And we see that they have a, a very small admittance value at the lowest frequency. And we see that it's a very large ratio. And then at the high frequency, as I said, both systems start to resonate. Just to highlight how the, the, the by dividing the systems, we can improve its, we can improve them numerically. Here we present the condition number, which is the ratio between the largest to the smallest eigenvalues. And we see the original admittance matrix have a very large condition number, so it has a more poor representability. And as we divide it in the group with impotence, we see the condition number has decreased considerably. And we see that uh, regardless if the short circuit idempotent group or the open circuit idempotent group, we see they have a similar behavior for all, all the frequency range of interest. Then uh, what we have here, it's uh, we subject all of the two sets of matrices to our rational approximations. We have used the well-known vector feeding package and uh, we have considered both the direct term and the impulsive term and the rational part. One uh, issue of this representation that uh, it's related that one has to consider that passivity should be enforced to obtain stable time domain responses. And uh, the direct fitting, it's uh, has shown that it has a very very poor fitting as one would expect. And the one advantage of dividing the systems, and then we can enforce the passivity in each matrix independently. So just to show here, we have the results of the passivity enforcement. When we consider both matrix combined, we see the violation achieves a highest number and the enforcement is considerably more slow if we 
enforce them separate uh, one at a time. Just remember that uh, two stable systems combined together remain stable. So here we have the feeding results. Here for both, those, those are the actual coupled matrices, grouped matrix, I mean. And here we have the eigenvalues. You see that both the eigenvalues of the original data and the ones obtained with the fitting results have presented a very accurate response for all the frequency range of interest. Just to remind that direct fitting, it's a troublesome approach. Usually one is limited to something around 100 poles. A larger order than this may lead to numerical stability problems. I mean, the passivity enforcement may not find a feasible solution. As we divided in two independent groups, we were able to use 80 poles for each. So it's a 160 poles realizations for the whole systems. And yet we obtain a very simple passivity enforcement. So this is our test case in the time domain. We see we have a step-like voltage at phase at node one, and then the, this implies that the whole system is divided in two sets of Norton equivalents. Each one represented use a uh, recursive formulation which is well known and it's been the, the standard for the realizations of frequency dependent networks. Here we have the time response. We see that when compared with the numerical Laplace transform, a very accurate response was found. Here we have the output at node seven and the, the output at node 10, the inducive voltage. Both cases, a very good agreement is, was achieved. And we reached the main conclusions of our work. Our work has been on the investigation of the idea whether we could group the independent decompositions of a given network equivalent and see if it is a feasible solution. To test the system, it was applied to the non-uniform line associated with a wide river crossing. One advantage of this model grouping is the natural separation between small and large eigenvalues. The approach allowed to avoid error magnifications typically found in the simulation response of frequency domain equivalent. And we believe the main contribution of this approach is the possibility of independently fitting the group and enforcing the passivity of each group in an independent form. We thank you and we are here open to your comments and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now it's time to ask questions. Some of you are saying that you cannot see the Q&A uh, window. It's actually in Zoom. It's, uh, you have to push the button and it opens the Q&A window. But if you want, you can ask, uh, you can uh, ask questions by unmuting your, your mic if, if, you, if I can do that for you. Uh, any questions? Xiao Peng, did you have a question? Hi, Rang. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead if you okay. have a question. Okay. Uh, 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 in the presentation, I, I'm not very familiar with this topic, so maybe this question seems um, a bit um, uh, easy. Maybe uh, in the presentation, I see uh, a, a step um, uh, is to uh, decompose the uh, admittance matrix Y n into two matrices, and the two matrices have lower rank. Uh, that is the Y O C and the Y S C. I'm not. I, I my question is. Um, how um, how do you um, interpret these two matrices? Because, uh, because uh, I see uh, the speaker uh, says one of the metrics is um, open circuit like uh, matrix and another is short circuit like. So how is the um, what is the physical meaning of this decomposition? 
I mean, what 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 element is open circuited or short circuited? Antonio, hi, Jean. Can can I speak? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, the idea of open circuit would be like you have the response of your systems and you, you have excited voltage one side and the other terminals are all open. And for the short circuit, it's the, the opposite situation. You excite one voltage with all terminals remaining short circuit and then you obtain the induced currents in all the, the elements. But the idea remains of idempotent is we are just rewriting the whole, uh, let's say, the actual eigenvalue decomposition. So we, we reach two sets of matrices. The one advantage is to reduce the number of passivity violations as the systems are, let's say, more well-behaved. They have similar behavior. So it, won't, it will be less of a challenge for the numerical feeding procedure. Thank you. I have a Q&A question that says, how do they handle similar eigenvalues? No problem. It, it, will, it will, will be fitted, combined together. The same as we would have in a conventional eigen, the, the eigen system decomposition. Okay. Any other question or we move ahead? I think it's uh, very good. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this Welcome. presentation. So now we move to the next presentation. Uh, so we will project the screen of uh, Lydia. Lydia, please project your screen. Uh, Lydia, it's the paper is a voltage-based detection method for lightning discharges at distribution networks, uh, presented by Lydia Fonseca Ribeiro. Livia Fonseca Ribeiro was born in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. She holds a master's degree in electrical engineering in the field of electrical energy systems from Federal University of Santa Catarina in 2020. She graduated from the Federal Center of Technological Education of Minas Gerais in 2017. In 2014, she was an exchange student for over a year at the Brazilian government uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, program at San Diego State University in the United States. In Chicago, she was a researcher for a group at Illinois Institute of Technology in 2015. She currently works as a project manager at Rendimento Engenharia. Please uh, go ahead, present. Okay, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Livia Fonseca Ribeiro. I'm glad to be here today, directly from Brazil, to present the article entitled by A Voltage-Based Detection Method for Lightning Discharges at Distribution Networks. Uh, it was written by me, Miguel Moreto, Arlan Betiol, Douglas Figueiredo, and Igor Cajala. Here we have the overview of this presentation. First of all, I will give you a brief introduction about issues due to the incidence of lightning discharges and distribution systems. Next, I will present the simulation model and the proposed detection scheme. After that, I will show all the testing and the results obtained from them. Finally, I will present the conclusions of this study, do some acknowledgements and show the references consulted. This study deals with the incidence of lightning discharges and electrical power systems. It is the most frequent cause of overvoltage and power failure, which can damage equipment and interrupt the power supply. As a result, it can negatively affect the indicators of electrical power continuity and quality. Besides, it can cause high financial losses. Currently, no protective equipment is dedicated to deal with lightning discharge detection. So, power utilities struggle to provide explanations to the regulatory agencies regarding the interruption of energy supplies resulting from this natural phenomenon. The method proposed is not intended to be used as protection against lightning discharge, 
but rather as a post-operation diagnostic tool. A simulation model was proposed in order to simulate the incidence of a direct lightning discharge. The IEEE 34 bus feeder shown in figure one was chosen as a test feeder. It was proposed in 1992 and is well known. This feeder has a nominal voltage of 24.9 kilovolts. The main branch measures approximately 57 kilometers with unbalanced loading. Lightning discharges have high frequency characteristics differently from the level of the rated uh, system frequency, which in Brazil is 60 Hertz. Therefore, each component model should be frequency dependent. The ATP AMTP software was used to implement appropriated models of lightning discharges, line segments, uh, pole, insulators, surge arresters, rounding elements, and transformers. It is a short presentation, so I will not give details about these models, but all of them are referenced and well described in the article. The sampling frequency was 50,360 hertz, and the data used uh, corresponds to the local utilities procedures. Now I will present the proposed detection scheme. It is composed by three parts filtering, transient detection, and fault classification. The voltages measured at the secondary of a three-phase potential transformer and the distribution systems uh, substation are the inputs of the filtering part. The filtering part is composed by part transform and wavelet transform. It aimed to condense the three-phase signal into just two, the direct and zero components. The discrete wavelet transform main goal is to separate rated frequency and disturbance by calculating the approximation and detail coefficients. The detail coefficients help to identify the presence of lightning discharge characteristics. The direct wavelet transform was implemented using family Daubisch 4 to obtain the detail coefficients of direct and zero components. Great results were obtained just using the first level of decomposition. After that, we have the scheme second part, transient detection. Uh, the main purpose is to detect if any significant transient occurs. It is composed by the energy calculation and the establishment of an adaptive threshold. So for this, we calculate the energy of the detail coefficients of direct and zero components according to equations seven and eight. The maximum and minimum energy values are collected from the energy first two cycles. Then adaptive thresholds are calculated by determining the maximum deviation value described by equation nine and the rate of change accept acceptable on the system status state described by equation 10. If both thresholds are surpassed, the time instant of the transient is identified. The signal is scanned from the disincent to the end of the data and the energy maximum values uh, associated with the detail coefficient of the direct and zero components are identified. The last scheme part is the fault classification. It just makes the difference between the maximum points observed after the transient occurrence of the direct and zero components of energy. Whether this difference is over 100,000 means a direct lightning discharge has reached the distribution system. Some events were simulated to test the efficiency of the detection scheme to distinguish lightning strikes from them. 
such as low impedance faults, model as resistance uh, at three branches, high impedance faults designed as an anti-parallel diode arrangement, uh, lateral energizing and de-energizing performed by a switch on 818 branch, capacitor bank switching on and switching off performed by a switch uh, of a capacitor bank power at 830 branch. In table three, uh, there is a summary of the simulated events characterizing their results by node, phase, uh, instant, transient instant, transient occurrence, and uh, lightning discharge detection. As we can see, events one through nine are lightning discharges in different nodes and at the same phase, phase B. In all of them, the transient was identified by the scheme and the lightning discharges uh, was, were detected. Events 10 through 19 uh, have different characteristics from lightning discharge. Their results show the, that the transient core and uh, the, their calls are in the lightning discharges. Now I will show results from the first event of the summary, uh, which were a lightning discharge over um, over phase B and node uh, 808. Figure 10 shows uh, the three phase substation voltages uh, measured at the secondary of the potential transformer. Although the discharge occurred in phase B, all others were uh, directly affected due to the mutual coupling between phases. We noticed that before and after the transient, the, voltage, uh, the voltages have the same behavior and the amplitude peak under the influence of the lightning is expressively high, over 6,000. In figure 11, there are the results of part transform. Even under steady state, the direct component shown the, an oscillatory behavior and the zero component was approximately new. Uh, that reflects the unbalanced load feeder characteristic. The direct component was oscillated with peak value approxima approximately uh, a, a 115 volts, which is the standard voltage of potential transformers. And the discharge incidence re reflect in the systems is observed in the results of the zero component. The maximum value measured for zero component was nearly 5.9 kilovolts and direct amplitude is still at the same level as before. In figure 12, there are the voltage uh, wavelet decompositions of the components direct and zero. The detail coefficient amplitude related uh, to component zero is much lar larger than that obtained for the direct component. The calculated energy for the detail coefficients are shown in figure 13 with the logarithm scale. The magnitude order of peak energy of the zero and the direct component have great difference. So this paper presents a detailed simulation model of the IEEE 34 bus test feeder suitable for lightning discharge studies. The detection scheme proposed significantly simplifies the task of analyzing the cause of shutdowns and damaging transients in an overhead distribution network due to a direct atmospheric discharge. In conclusion, the results uh, demonstrate that lightning discharge detection at the substation is possible 
without the need for expensive and complex da data acquisition systems, just measuring voltage signals. We would like to thank Celeste Distribuição and CAPS for their financial support. And here we have all the consulted references. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now it's time for questions. Any questions in the Q&A? Questions? There are no questions. So I do not see any questions in the Q&A for the moment. So I guess we should proceed. Uh, I, I will check again. So I guess we can proceed with, uh, there are no questions. So I guess we can proceed with the next paper. So thank you very much for this presentation, Lydia. Now we proceed with the next paper. Andre, uh, you would have to project it. Uh, it's actually a paper pre uh, entitled Simulation of Electromagnetic Transients with Modelica, Accuracy and Performance Assessment for Transmission Line Models. It's presented by Ali Reza Masum. Ali Reza Masum is currently a PhD student at Polytechnic Montreal. His research interests are computation of electromagnetic transients using high-level uh, programming languages and high-level methods. Please. Hi there. I'm so pleased to present you the article titled Simulation of Electromagnetic Transients with Modelica, Accuracy and Performance Assessment for Transmission Line Models. In this presentation, first we have a short introduction on the Modelica. Then the theory of transmission line is briefed, focusing on wideband and constant parameter model. Next, it's explained how we model transmission line using the Modelica language. Afterwards, the results obtained by simulation in open Modelica environment are compared with EMTP. We will speak about the accuracy and performance of our models. At the end, we will go through conclusion. Let us start with a question. What if we could model physical system as easy as writing its equations on a paper? Yes, it's possible. Modelica is an equation-based declarative language specialized for simulation of hybrid physical systems. Each model is described by equations, as opposed to usual programming languages, or to block diagram representations that commonly employ assignment statements. What does equation base mean? It means the variables are defined as a function of time. The focus is on differential algebraic equations, which describe our dynamic systems. It allows modeler to concentrate further on defining the models rather than how the equations are solved. Modelica is a dictative language in the sense that it defines the facts and relations rather than defining workflow or imperative assignments. It assumes that the algorithm used to the numerical software will be provided by an appropriate compiler of the language. It's the language duty to sort and optimize these equations, make it causal, and finally convert it to C code and hand it over to the select solver. Modelica is not the only equation-based language, but for sure the best one so far. The language supports the concept of object orientation, such as inheritance, modularity, and encapsulation. In the procedure and imperative languages such as C and Fortran, compared to declarative ones, it's a programmer that defines the order of assignments line by line. But in Modelica, it's not important where an equation is coded. As a consequence, it's possible to create a causal models. This means models with no predefined input and output relation. Therefore, Modelica gives us more clarity, which is important for pedagogical purposes. Modelica is an open source language. There are many commercial and non-commercial environments such as Open Modelica, Simulation X, Daimola, MapleSoft, and Scilab who support language. Modelica supports FMI, a standard which is supported in much software for the purposes of co-simulation and model exchange. It's super interesting feature. 
Okay, let's come back to our application. The dynamic model of a power system is a hybrid differential algebraic equation system, or DAE. The DAE systems contain discontinuities. These discontinuities represent the action of switches and overexcitation limiter in the controller and etc., which may cause the dynamics of some system variables to alter abruptly. One of the main motivations for the use of modelical EMT modeling lies on the ability of the language to express hybrid mathematical models. Modelical provides constructs for expressing both continuous and, dis and discrete time variabilities. Historically, the EMT tools use the imperative languages, and often differential algebraics are discretized in component level. The solver is usually trapezoidal, Euler, or combination of them, and model and solver are tightly integrated. Modeling of transmission line is one of the most important and most complicated aspects of the proper system modeling. For EMT simulations, the most appropriate models are those who consider the parameters distributed along the distance. Equation 1 is the principal equation describing the transmission line in frequency domain. These equations represent the line at each end by a Norton equivalent circuit. The current and voltage in one side of the line is linked by the voltage and current in other side multiplied by the propagation function H. Constant parameter is a simple case in which the impedance and admittance matrices of line is calculated in a fixed frequency, for example 60 Hz. In consequence, the matrices H and YC in equation 2 are frequency independent. However, since the propagation modes cannot be represented at high frequencies, the CP model is only recommended for modeling lines in analysis of problems with limited frequency dispersion. If we apply inverse Laplace transform to equation 1, the equation 4 is obtained with a small computational burden. Wideband or universal line model is considered an accurate model for both transmission lines and cables. The calculations are totally different because in this case the impedance and admittance matrices are frequency dependent which in turn yields the frequency dependent matrices of H and YC. So using convolution for transforming from frequency domain to time domain is inevitable. Computationally, convolution is a heavy burden job. The basic idea of frequency dependent line models in EMT type programs is to use rational approximation for admittance and propagation matrices. Rational functions allow efficient computation of convolution integrals through recursive schemes. Vector fitting method is a robust numerical technique used to represent the propagation function H and characteristic function YC as a sum of rational functions. Equations 6 and 7 represents the YC and H as a sum of zeros and poles. Vector fitting is not in the scope of this paper and we go through it. The model can be directly converted into a state space form. This is what we need in modelical language. Considering terminal K of the line model, equation 8 is rational representation of the product YC VK and equation 10 is rational representation of product H times IM plus YCVM. Now we can calculate the shunt and history current in time domain. Equation 9 and 11 provide the basis for the wideband model and are exactly what we use in our modeling in Modelica. It's super interesting since in conventional MT tools we need a large amount of codes to, for interpolation, integration, and change of variables as well. Well, now we are in good position to show how these models are implemented by Modelica. 
The schematic of steep line model is illustrated here. As described earlier, we need two types of calculations. First, calculations related to the history terms, and second, calculations related to Norton equivalent. In Modelica, the input parameters are characteristic impedance, propagation time, resistance, and length of line for single phase or in modal form for multi-phase line. If the line is untransposed, we have to give the modal transformation matrix as a parameter. Because lack of time, here I just show the codes for wideband model whose are more complicated. Here, in the right side, we see the schematic of wideband model exactly what is implemented in Modelica. The parameters of vector fitting are read from EMTP and converted to Modelica readable file directly. Then the shunt current is calculated using equation 9. In this slide, the various parts of Norton equivalent in Modelica are illustrated. You can see here in equation compartment, the injected current into the line is the sum of shunt current and hysteric current. And in the next line, the shunt current is coded exactly as seen in equation 9. The one by one correspondence is highlighted here. This slide shows the calculations of history terms. We can see the same procedure in order to calculate the history terms of wideband model. Here we can see how the derivative and delay operators made easy the modeling. Well, now we can check and validate our models with EMTP, which is a famous and accurate software EMT domain. In this case study, a six conductors, three phases cable has been simulated. The data of the test are found in EMT examples. Each pole of the switch is closed at a specific time. The voltage curves for conductors and shields at the receiving end of the cable are found here. The dashed black line denotes EMTP results. It's observed that the modelica curves stick to EMTP bonds exactly. I draw your attention to the CPU time and the relative error norm which is found here. This is the second test case. We have used IEEE 13 bus network. We know that the network is a distribution network. All lines are untransposed with short length. The loads are unbalanced. So it provides a good example for testing the models coded in Modelica. The scenario is to create a single phase airport on bus 6 and 5 here at t equals 60 milliseconds and tripping the line by the CB2 at t equals 160 milliseconds. Let's observe the voltage curves compared with MTP. As you can see in the right side, we see that the modelica curves stick to MTP bonds in this case as well. Uh, in the right side of this slide, the currents uh, passing through the CB2 are compared. We see the same results uh, here. In the left side, uh, an accuracy analysis has been carried out using the results obtained by the solvers, uh, trapezoidal, DASL, and IDA. Numerically speaking, uh, the table shows that accuracy of modeling with the language is excellent. You can see the figures here. This table shows a comparison of CPU times. The CPU time for DASL, IDA, which are adaptive solvers is better than the fixed step uh, trapezoidal solver. However, as you can see here, it's not satisfactory yet in comparison with EMTP. There are many reasons for that, such as optimized solver and using the modified augmented nodal analysis EMTP. Moreover, there are some techniques in way to accelerate the computation in Modelica. Let's find our presentation with conclusion. It's been said that Modelica is a powerful language for EMT simulation. The two major electrical elements, I mean the wideband and CP model, are demonstrated here. It's observed that Modelica models are easily readable and understandable, which is super important for pedagogical purposes. We saw how the built-in operators such as derivative and delay can make easier modeling. Since the model 
is decoupled from solver, therefore, it's possible to switch from one solver to another, which is the native feature. Modelica is compatible with FMI. The feature allows us to co-simulation and model exchange. This is super important because the number of software in supporting the standard is increasing. The computation time is not comparable with EMT type tools, but the future is promising. We believe that there is the opportunity for Modelica EMT simulation of power systems. In this slide, we have marked our future objectives. Improvement of performance and developing an EMT detailed library comprising more power electric models, such as synchronous machine and saturable transformer are of the major of them. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. Uh, now it's time to ask questions. Uh, I do not see any questions in the Q&A. Any questions, please? There was a question Ali Reza raised okay. about uh, solvers. Can you comment on the solvers of Modelica? Uh, uh, yes, uh, hi. Uh, thank you. Mm, for attention, uh, the solver is, uh, as mentioned in the presentation, the solver is totally to with the modeling. And we can um, select a range of solvers, implicit or explicit, uh, the adaptive solvers or fixed steps uh, solvers. Uh, it's not important. The, of course, uh, it uh, depends on the IDE, the compiler who supports the solver. Uh, for example, in the Open Modelica IDE, we can uh, select the uh, Dassel, Ida, Trapezoidal, uh, Euler, back, backward Euler, forward Euler. This is available. But in other sol uh, IDs, it's not maybe limited. It's an option. And another question was, is this open source? Yes, yes, uh, sure. This is an open source uh, language. Uh, supported by the Modelica Association, uh, it's uh, uh, possible to download the uh, the environment, uh, Open Modelica, and uh, it's uh, possible uh, for codes. It's accessible to change to modify it. It's open source. Yes. Okay. Any other question? No more questions. Uh, so. Thank you very much, Ali Reza. So now You're we are going to move to the next presentation. Uh, passivity uh, enforcement of wide band line model through perturbation of residues and pulse. Andre, you have to project the, the presentation which is uh, recorded. So the presenter is uh, Ilhan Kochar. Ilhan Kochar is a full professor at Polytechnique Montreal. He received a PhD degree from Polytechnique in 2019. Uh, Ilhan's career highlights include contributions to professional simulation tools and development of solutions for large scale integration of inverter based resources. He has performed many grid consulting projects that cover design, modeling, analysis, and validation of field measurements. His research is on the development of concepts, models, and methods for analysis of power systems in a wide spectrum and large scale integration of power electronics based systems into grids. Please, we can start the video. Welcome to this presentation of our paper. The title is Passivity Enforcement of Wideband Line Model Through Coupled Perturbation of Residues and Poles. I will be presenting you the paper today. My name is Ilhan Kochar and I'm a professor at Polytechnic Morning. First, a brief introduction. Frequency-dependent line and cable models, such as universal line model and frequency-dependent cable model, represent characteristic admittance and propagation matrix functions in the form of rational functions. This provides efficient simulations in time domain through recursive convolution schemes. However, rational fitting algorithms do not guarantee passive models. As of today, there is no method that enforces passivity at the fitting stage. A model is deemed passive 
if its line admittance matrix equivalent is positive real. The line admittance matrix equivalent means the admittance matrix that you obtain using the fitted characteristic admittance and propagation function. Violation of passivity may lead to unstable simulations in time domain. These manifest in the form of numerical explosions. So what happens if a white band line model is not passive? The current approach is to enforce passivity by altering the matrix of residues of either the propagation matrix or characteristic admittance. Note that passivity violation is due to fitting errors and particularly encountered in the fitting of H, but the line admittance is a function of both YC and H, so although not guaranteed, it is possible to achieve passivity enforcement by perturbing only the residues of YC. Another point is to keep in mind that residue perturbation causes a deviation in the frequency response of the model and in the line admittance matrix. This deviation must be minimized to preserve the accuracy of the model. We should meet the fitting tolerance criterion even after the perturbation. Finally, we can group the previous works in three categories. First category is the perturbation of residues of the characteristic admittance. This is implementation wise straightforward since there is a linear relation between line admittance matrix and the residues of characteristic admittance. Second category is the application of external correction terms. This approach has the highest risk of accuracy loss. Finally, the perturbation of the residues of propagation matrix is mentioned in the literature, but the relation between the residues of H and the admittance matrix is nonlinear, and there is no clear formulation in the literature to cite. So why do we see only residue perturbation in the literature? and not, for example, perturbation of poles. This is likely caused by the easiness of formulating the induced deviation as a function of the controllability gradient. This is only possible for perturbation of the matrices of residues. Another argument in favor of residue perturbation is that much effort is invested in finding the natural frequencies of any system or poles, and hence they should be left intact. In this paper, we explore and present the advantages and limitations of perturbing all elements of the characteristic admittance, not only residues, but also poles and constant term. We propose to define the induced deviation in terms of the relative error and Frobenius distance between systems for accuracy preservation. Before going further, I would like to go through the basic equations related to nodal admittance, propagation function, characteristic admittance, and passivity condition. The propagation function is fitted using this function here on the left. It is composed of delay groups and a set of poles for each delay group and residue matrices. The number of delay groups is equal to or less than the number of conductors. This is because some delays are very close or repetitive, so we group them. For each delay group, I have a common set of poles, and for each pole and for each entry of H, I have a residue. Therefore, I have here residue matrices. The size is equal to NC by NC, given that NC is the number of conductors. The characteristic admittance is fitted using this function here. I have a common set of poles for the characteristic admittance. And for each pole and for each entry of YC, I have a residue. Therefore, I see again here a residue matrix with a dimension of NC by NC. And I have a matrix here consisting of constant terms. The nodal admittance matrix can be generated using the fitted H and YC, and this nodal admittance matrix should be passive. The passivity condition here is done through the theta function of Yn. Theta function here is the sum of Yn with its Hermitian. All the eigenvalues of this function should be larger than zero for all frequency samples. 
When we do frequency sweep to test the passivity of my N, we should make sure that we have a fine sampling and we don't miss any sample. An alternative would be use of the Hamiltonian test, which of course shows all the passivity violations, however, it scales poorly with the increasing number of orders. Therefore, because of its robustness, we use the frequency sweeping technique to understand if there's a passivity violation or not. Here, another step before applying the passivity enforcement is the similarity transformation. In order to reduce the size of the matrices involved in passivity verification, we apply a similarity transformation, which is given with the matrix here, J. And the final matrix that I obtained by applying this similarity transformation is YJ. And I'm checking the eigenvalues of YJ in order to reduce the size of the matrices involved in passivity verification. So this is the final passivity condition that I would like to check. And I would like to make sure that my matrix is passive and my model is passive. In this slide, we can see the proposed formulation. The equation here represents the proposed formulation, which is a linear approximation of the passivity condition. I have perturbations in vector form for residues, poles, and constant term, such that it makes all the eigenvalues of the yj function on the positive side. The relation between the eigenvalues of the theta function of yj and the perturbations in residues, poles, and constant term is nonlinear. Therefore, I am here proposing a linear approximation which uses the first differential of the eigenvalue function. If I had only perturbations in residues, I wouldn't need such a linear approximation because the formulation would be linear already. This is what we see in the conventional literature. However, in this paper, we want to explore, present, and understand what happens if we perturbate all these elements. Can we fix cases that cannot be solved with residue perturbation only? Here, you can see the relative perturbations in vector form on the right-hand side. This is the perturbations of residues, poles, and constant term. The details of the first differential of the eigenvalue function are available at the appendix of the paper. So the readers who are willing to implement this technique can find all the details at the appendix. Once I apply this perturbation, I need also metrics to understand the efficiency and to see how much deviation that this perturbation induces. So the resulting deviation is measured by applying the feature selective validation method between DC and 100 MHz with 100 samples per decade. FSV gives a metric named Global Difference Measure, GDM which yields a low value when the two data sets are in good agreement, in other words, when the deviation is low. Ideally, GDM should be less than 0.1 so that I have an excellent level of similarity. If it is between 0.1 and 0.2, in this case, I have a very good similarity. And if it is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, it is still good. Up to 0.8, it is considered fair, and after that point, I should avoid using this perturbation. And I should try something else because I lose my accuracy and the deviation is too much that I cannot meet anymore the fitting tolerance that is requested by the fitter. Here we see the test case that we used to understand the advantages of the proposed method. We have here three coaxial cables and we have two conductors for each cable. 
We obtain five variations by using this case by varying geometric and electric parameters. Here you can see all the parameters, the resistance of conductors, the soil resistivity, permittivity, insulation loss factor, and also the geometric dimensions. And you see here the length of the cable is different. So we have five different test cases. Then we use universal line model or frequency dependent cable model to obtain our uh, frequency dependent models or white band model. Here we can see that the number of poles of characteristic admittance it varies between 11 and 20. Here I can see the number of groups related to the feeding of propagation function and it varies between 4 and 6. The number of poles it goes up to 31. This is the number of poles per group. I only write here the maximum number of poles that I see. And whether I apply DC correction or not to improve the feeding accuracy at low frequencies. I can see the feeding frequency range. It may start from 0.01 Hz and it may go up to 10 MHz or even 100 MHz. And I can see the here passivity violations. In all cases, there is a violation of passivity. And I show here only the maximum violations. And this is observed with case number 2, which is equal to minus 1.18, 10 to the power of minus 4. And this is observed at 35.5 Hz. So, I apply three different perturbations, either residue perturbation, this is the conventional approach available in the literature, and I also apply combined residue pole perturbations, which is a new method and proposed in this paper. And finally, I also try combined residue pole and constant term perturbations. For the five different cases, what I see here that with residue perturbation, I can fix case number one, case number four, and case number five. By applying the combined residue pole perturbation, I can also fix case number two. When I add constant term perturbation, I can fix all cases. On the right hand side, we use we see the GDM parameter, so it shows us the level of deviation. And I can see here that when residue perturbation is successful, it results in very good GDM values. Whereas with combined residue pole or residue pole constant term perturbation, sometimes I'm in the fair band. So when it comes to conclusions, perturbing all elements has the best performance in terms of removing passivity violations for the considered cases. However, Residue perturbation induces the lowest deviation whenever it is successful. So we recommend perturbing all elements only when residue perturbation fails. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now it's time for questions. Any questions? No questions in the Q&A, no questions in the chat room. Okay. <clears throat> okay, well, I cannot ask any questions. I'm co-author, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, per perhaps... Uh, there was also a slide in the end, a thank you slide for the um, research funding organizations, such as uh, okay. the CHAIR program. But somehow it uh, it didn't appear here. Yeah. It's not it. Okay, so uh, since I don't see any questions in the Q and A, neither in the chat room, uh, I think we can move ahead. So uh, we can move ahead now to the basically the last paper. Uh, yes. I guess Tarek, you will have to project your screen. I'm so, here. Do you hear me? Yes. Just project Good. your screen, please. High yes, performance certainly. computing engines for the FPGA based simulation of the ULM. The paper yes. is presented oh. by Professor Tarek Ul Bashir. 
Tarek Ul Bashir is assistant professor with the Department of Computer and Software Engineering at Polytechnic Montreal. From 2007 to 2018, he was with Opal RT Technologies, holding various positions in the R&D department. From 2018 to 2020, he was a research associate with Polytechnic Montreal. His research interests include FPGA-based computing with applications to modeling and real-time simulation of power electronics and power systems. Please. I'm sorry, I'm trying to share my screen. Um, I don't, uh, okay, I, I think here I have to. Um, do you see my screen now? Uh, not for the moment. Not for the moment, I'm sorry for this. You have a green button below, it says share screen. Yeah, I saw the button, but uh, it doesn't seem yeah. to. Uh, and you have to okay, share the here. application, okay. not do like then, me that I projected okay. my entire screen. Okay. Okay. Do you see my screen now, or no, at least the good. presentation? Go ahead. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Okay. Perfect. So, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on the, on the time zone. Uh, I'll be presenting a, a paper called "High Performance Computing Engines for the FPGA-Based Simulation of the ULM." That is the universal line model that the last two presentations uh, were dealing with. Um, this is the outline of the presentation. I'll, uh, I'll briefly introduce the motivation and uh, the problem I'm trying to solve. I'll present the mathemat mathematical foundation of uh, the model, which was already discussed in the previous presentations. And then I'll go through the FPGA implementation of the line model show some results and uh, draw conclusions and um, forecast future work. Um, so regarding introduction, the main motivation of this work is probably uh, the hardware in the loop testing of traveling wave fault locators. So this is a new technology that is present on the market where um, relay manufacturers are able to locate a fault on the line independent of its length with an accuracy of a tower span that is 300 meters. So you can have a line of, let's say, 500 kilometers. And if a fault um, arrives, then you can locate the fault and easily, I'm sorry, I don't know why it went to the next slide. You can locate the fault very um, accurately by observing the time arrival. I don't know if you see my uh, mouse where I'm pointing to. Yes. Okay, very good. So this is TK1 and TK, TM1. So if we compare the arrival time of the wavefront on both ends, we can determine the location of the fault. This is called the double-ended um, fault location. The other approach is to compare the um, time arrival of, on a single side and uh, deduce the location. Um, the accuracy is achieved by uh, sampling the um, signals, the voltages and the currents at a one megahertz sampling rate. And when um, times come to test this kind of apparatus, there is no technology available. So there is an effort presently in real-time simulation to offer a real-time model for these um, relays. So here we see the relays from SEL. And um, this figure comes from another paper we published with decode authors. And the purpose here is to emulate the simple grid on the simulator and feed the relays with real signals and test the algorithm. So this allows the manufacturers, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know why it, it keeps moving from one slide to the other. So it allows a lot of flexibility in testing their algorithm and scenarios. However, the problem is that the simulation time step needs to be of one microsecond or less. Not only this, we have shown in the previous paper that the line model needs to be very accurate. It has to be traveling wave type line model, so no pi sections. It has to be frequency dependent. Here we tested the uh, constant parameter line, the CP, um, sometimes referred to as Berger Online, and we demonstrated that false trends, false peaks here are observed. So the double, uh, the yeah, the double-ended fault location was correct. However, the single-ended was unfeasible because of these false transients here. So what we are trying to do here is to implement the ULM on FPGA. The ULM is very uh, computing uh, hungry. 
um, and what we want to do is to achieve a time step of one microsecond. So I'll briefly go through the mathematical formulation of the model. Uh, it has been presented uh, previously. So we have a multi-conductor line here. It can be a cable, it can be a line, an aerial line. And we have um, the current at the terminal. We have the incident and the reflected current. And this line here will be replaced by uh, two northern equivalents, one at each terminal. Uh, we have a characteristic, I'm sorry, characteristic admittance matrix um, that is um, lumped. And then we have a propagation function that will read the current on the other terminal and will reflect it. And it will apply a delay. Um, usually these matrices are fitted and are given in the frequency domain. And uh, when we want a time domain solution, a state space approach is used here. You see the equations. So we have multiple states called here xy and xh for the propagation. And we see that uh, on the propagation function side, we have these delays that are grouped as the previous uh, presentation mentioned. At the end, we have a history current that is injected in the Norton equivalent. And this one is obtained from the sum of these two terms. I'm sorry for this. So we see that a lot of computation is needed for each single time step. Um, let's see how we can implement this on FPGA. Uh, I'll start with an overview of the algorithm and the hardware computing engine. So um, the audience needs to understand that here everything is done in parallel. So whenever we see a block, there is actually a um, application specific processor that handles the computation. Like here, we have a nodal solver. So this nodal solver will take all the independent sources that can be uh, voltage or current sources and will produce some outputs as well as the reflected currents at the line terminals and the voltages. These values, here we see a vector, are fed to N instances of what I call ULM computing engine. That is a computing engine dedicated to simulate one line. So we compute the reflected current and the voltages, we feed them to these engines, and these will send us the shunt history current and the incident current that will be fed into a buffer. So the algorithm reads like follows. We compute the reflected and the terminal voltage here. This is uh, sent to update the buffer here for the propagation function and used to compute the history shunt and the incident current for the next time point. So there is like, um, an anticipation, and we can then move for the next time point of the simulation. Each computing engine is comprised of two modules, one for the YC function and the second one for the H function. If we start with the first one, the model for the YC, this is quite straightforward. So we have multiple uh, state space that need to be computed. We do that serially. So we take one state variable at a time and we update it. This is the block diagram of it. And once we're done with this, we sum all these states to produce the shunt history current. We can manipulate, we can move the blocks around to make it um, faster, to reduce the latency. And this is done by putting in parallel this block here and this one. Basically, it's just the sum of the two. So we here we update the terms. And once we are done with that, we feed it to a reduction unit. And what is mentioned here in red, FDP SAF, this stands for Fuse Data Path Self-Alignment Format. So this is a technology or a method that I have proposed many years ago to produce custom-made floating point cores on FPGA that are characterized with very low latency. So Basically, in hardware, uh, floating point and fixed point are the two uh, approaches to uh, computations on FPGA. And floating point is the preferred one we, when we do scientific computations. However, it has a hardware cost and 
it's uh, characterized by a very high latency. By using this approach, by fusing the data path, that means that by fusing the multiplication and the addition and using this self-alignment format, we can have modules that multiply and add very efficiently and that uh, exhibit very low latency. So for the YC model, this is um, very easy to implement. For the H model, it's a bit more complicated. One of the reasons is that because usually the H model will uh, Im imply more computations. Here is the uh, a reminder for the equation. We see that we have a delay here that is not necessarily an integral uh, multiple of the time step. So if we if this ex uh, equation here shows two terms, actually we'll be reading three values. The H model here. I'm sorry we'll read data from a buffer. So we'll be reading three values at a time, and then we'll multiply by this beta, and then we'll update the state. So how can we improve this computation? First, we need to understand that here we cannot put this MVM and the state update in parallel because of the um, interpolation that needs to be uh, done. So what we do here is we put them serially. And then what we observe is, since there is a buffer here, maybe we could take the buffer and put it at the end. If we do so, what will happen is we'll be able to read one sample whenever it is needed. This is what is shown here. I'll, I'll go back to the previous slide. So I'll compute the value that is needed and I'll put it in the memory. And that one will be read whenever needed. So if I go to the next slide, what we see here is we have the nodal solver that computes the Y, the V, and the incident current. And once these are available, the YC model module and the H model will start their computation. So if we simply implement as the equations are written, and we'll see that these are the latencies, and the latency of the line will be the maximum value of the two latencies. So this is shown here. This is illustrated. We suppose that the incident, uh, the shunt history current will be available before the incident current. However, this value here can be computed beforehand and made available as soon as the values are fed by the nodal solver. So we suppose we have these voltage and incident current arriving and we provide the solver with the next value it needs. However, I'm going back to the previous slide. However, we cannot just use an output buffer because these delays are different depending of the mode that is being considered. So we need an input buffer that is not too large, quite small, like maybe 50 um, with 50 samples that will be just to accommodate for the difference between the maximal delay and the um, minimal delay, and then we'll handle all the samples in an output buffer. So by doing so, we considerably reduce the latency and we can have a model that is very efficient. So now I'll move to the results. I have two test cases. The first one was just to assess the accuracy of the implementation. So what we did is we had a three-phase line and we apply the fold on phase A. And here we see the simulation. So this is for 0.25 second. And at 0.1 second, we apply the fold. And the fold is cleared after uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0.1 second. So the total duration here is 0.1. And what we see is that our result from the FPGA match the results from EMTP. So the model is very accurate. The second test case that is considered here is the traveling wave fault location. So we suppose that there is a, a phase to ground fault at 20 kilometers from terminal K. And we are reading and filtering the, and generating the traveling wave um, currents on terminal K and terminal M. And these are the observation. What we see is that the time duration between the two peaks, so between the peak at terminal K and the peak at terminal M is 202 microsecond. And this translates, so there is an equation uh, that gives, that translates time into um, distance. 
and this translates to 20.003 kilometers. So the accuracy is three meter in this case. Then we consider the, um, the two peaks that we see here. So the time duration here is 135 microseconds. So what we have demonstrated here that is that using this model, we can have an accuracy of less than 300 meters. Presently, in this case, it is 47 meters from the single ended um, configuration. Uh, this hasn't been achieved uh, in the uh, literature. Finally, if we look at the FPGA implementation, what we, we have few metrics that we would like to uh, present. The first one is that the clock frequency of the FPGA is quite high. So on FPGA, usually um, people um, can implement solvers with the clock frequency of 100, maybe 150 megahertz. Uh, this implementation here, because of the fused path, uh, SAF methodology, achieves 250 megahertz. So this is very uh, effective. The shortest latency that we can achieve using this model is 200 nanoseconds. This is more or less 50 clock cycles. This is very important because in this case, what we were um, trying to do is simply implement the model for real-time applications, but other applications can be uh, considered. And for that case, uh, it can be very important to be able to feed the solver, the computing engine, with new data to process in a pipeline fashion. So we could process a new line every 200 nanoseconds. This can be very interesting if uh, we target uh, the acceleration of EMT programs. This is, so this is uh, one of the aims one, uh, of this work. Um, however, it hasn't been tested in this paper. We also see that the memory, so in, when we do design on FPGA, we have what we call block RAMs. These are small memories that are um, uh, available on the, on the chip. So uh, the access is very fast and we see that it is not a limiting factor. We only used for the second test case only 16% and it, was, it wasn't a very big FPGA. So with larger FPGA, with better uh, memory resources, we could do uh, certainly more complex setups. Uh, the main limiting factor here was DSP. We see that for the second test case, we use almost everything. However, this FPGA is uh, dated. It's uh, from 2010, I believe, uh, and new technology provides many folds more um, DSPs. DSPs are blocks dedicated to do some computations, typically multiplication. So what this shows is probably one of the future avenues that should be taken is to share the uh, computing models for multiple lines. And this is one of our conclusions. So the conclusions, um, we show that we were able to implement the universal line model um, very efficiently with a latency of 200 nanoseconds. Uh, although the example shown here used a time step of one micro uh, because otherwise the number of samples would be uh, too large, um, but not really necessary for the application. We used, we combined a scheduling that was appropriate for the application as well as custom floating point operators to achieve low latency. And uh, what we have showed is that we are able to, to test a traveling wave application for double-ended as well as single-ended um, configurations. Finally, for future work, what we plan to do is to consider larger networks. So this was a very simple test case. We uh, plan to implement uh, computing engines that have hardware reuse, that is the same model is being used for multiple lines. And finally, we'd like to um, implement these models for the purpose of uh, the hardware acceleration of EMT uh, programs. So thank you for our attention. And that's thank gonna be much. all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. We have uh, one question from Professor Fu. 
Uh, it's about the nodal solver on FPGA, on FPGA for simulation mm -hmm. of distribution networks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is pre-computing inverse mana matrices for all possible switch uh, combinations still the best option? I believe it is the, the best option. Um, the other option is to use pedagogic model for the switches. However, these tend to introduce false transient. And in this paper, we use the mana with the resistive switch. So whenever we have a fault, we simply um, replace uh, we put basically uh, a small resistance to uh, from face to the ground. So we had only one switch. It was very easy to handle. Uh, in this case here, we used, uh, so this is another paper. Uh, I have the reference here. So that was another paper. In that one, we used uh, Pejovic. And uh, so um, in that case, we can handle more switches. However, it was very tricky to, um, set a proper value for the conductance of the Pejovic switch in order not to alter these signals here. So uh, to get the best accuracy, the resistive, resistive switch model is the best approach. Okay, any other question? I do not see any questions in the Q&A. Any other question from the audience? Since there are no more questions, I think we are right on time. It's already 9.41. So we can now conclude this session. Thank you very much for all Thank these you. excellent presentations. Uh, I don't think there is anything more to say. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, for also to Andre for helping us with the system. Uh, so we are getting more and more experience with this kind of stuff now. So thank you. Have a nice day to everybody. Bye-bye.